Okay, so the next set is Battletech Mercenaries, which came out in, in the summer of 1997 after the first World Championships. The expansion itself was 101 cards, and we've reviewed 10 Command, 10 Mechs, uh, but only eight missions. There are a lot less missions in this particular expansion. And that was also the theme for the following one, which was, uh, which was Mech Warrior. So in total, we're, we're looking at 28 cards of the, uh, the 101 set. Okay, quick reminder on the rating system. Uh, one is probably the worst rating possible. We suggest you feed that to your pet. Uh, five is average, good enough in friendly play, and then just enjoy the card for what it is. Uh, and then we get into the eight, nine in, uh, category then they're, they're excellent and, and possibly uh, utilizable in a, in a tournament. And, and 10 is you need to have one of these in your deck, if not more of them. Okay, so first what up, was, we, What was kind sorry. of the general, general atmosphere or kind of receipt of this? You know, it's coming on the back of Counter-Strike, which you know, was definitely kind of the disappointment, you know, and then, uh, you know, do you guys remember kind of how, how this was received by the community? You know, was it kind of uh, a new hope? as it were, for, for Battletech? I think generally the, the reception was better. They thought it was better than Counter-Strike. Obviously, there was a lot of hype with Worlds going on. Mm. There were a lot of rumors and comments flying around as well, but I, I'm not going to comment on that now because I know you've got a couple of special guests that, to talk to, and I'll, I'll let them deal with that. Um, so, you know, the, the people that liked Battletech were, were, were generally hyping for it and, and saw it as positive. Those people that may have been on the cusp and, and turned away generally didn't like it as much, obviously. Um, but you start to see changes in the game. Uh, Counter-Strike was maybe a bit too formulaic and, and they didn't know what they were trying to do and just kept things simple. This, uh, we start to see some divergence. Um, they start to try and buff certain types of deck or, or focus on certain aspects of the game uh, and, and support that. So they were hoping, or, or my reading of it was that they were hoping to, to uh, spread the, the deck uh, meta. Basically, when you look at World 97, then there were four Wolf decks, five Davian decks, and a Steiner deck in, in the top eight. Uh, and, and they wanted more diversity. Uh, from my perspective, looking at uh, the release of Mercenary, uh, the quality of the cards, the, the general all quality playability of the cards uh, is uh, many percentage points higher than the playability of the cards that you see in Counter-Strike. So if I'm a, an 18, 19 year old uh, freshman, sophomore in college playing this game, I'm going to spend my $3 on a mercenary pack long before I'm going to spend my $3 on a Counter-Strike pack and hope for a superior navigations because the chance of that rare in mercenaries being a playable rare that's going to be a fun card uh, is, is going to be much higher uh, by opening a mercenary pack. So as far as like uh, viability of a set, I think uh, they're definitely up on the upswing and it's, it's only going to get better from there. When you think about power creep in card games, um, they, they did a lot better uh, with uh, increasing a couple of ticks of the quality of the cards and, and the desirability of certain cards in a deck where Counter-Strike very few and far between uh, with regard to quality or desirability. All right, so we got first up, Aleta Kabrinsky. Who wants to take uh, this one? Uh, it's my choice. Awesome. Um, if, if you've got the set notes, then the little bracket after the name tells you who picked it. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I chose Aletha. Uh, I don't have the, the depth of knowledge of, of the, the history of, that you guys have of uh, all of the clan aspects and I haven't read all of the books or even any of them to be honest but from what I understand having talked to a few friends of mine and whatever else that this is actually where the the abilities of this person in the card have been replicated from from some elements within uh, the backstory themselves and, and okay fine good move guys and also another ghost bear pilot thank you very much this one has plus one initiative and plus one attack Poor old Vlad didn't get his attack in the last expansion, but hey ho. Uh, and the ability of preventing three damage to the mech piloted by Aletha if it's fast uh, is really, really good. 
it just screams put her on a dragonfly and go and have some fun um, and and that plus one makes a world of difference because a lot of the dragonflies have got three damage it saves you having to have the AP version of dragonfly C it saves you having to overheat on the dragonfly D sorry not D B uh, and and you can start killing resources with this so she she went straight into anybody's deck if they were playing ghost bear um, good card for my opinion yeah, and she's still tournament playable. I think she's an eight or a nine in the Ghost Bear deck that won uh, Worlds, the last Worlds in 2001. She was in there. Awesome. Do we know what, what she piloted in the uh, Allure or what mix? Dasher. Was it yeah. Dasher? Okay. All right. So a good start there. Let's uh, move on. We have uh, Difficult Terrain. My pick that. again. Maybe I'm going a bit nostalgic. Mm -hmm. I, I picked this because it was the first terrain card. The, the terrains that have come out since, things like Rocky Gorge, Civilian Settlement, Fog Shrouded Moors, all, all very playable. But they all started here. And I, and I think I had to play a little bit of a homage to their, to their origins. Um, the wording doesn't use terrain at that point. That then came later with, um, I think it was Arsenal where they started to, to use the terrain as a keyword. Mm. Um, but then they got uh, this one got rewritten in, in Commander's Edition, so you can see it there. Uh, and basically, it says play it on a site. Mechs attacking that site are one speed lower. So this is a recognition of all of those fast hunting wolf decks uh, and being able to to block them without the reliance on the mongoose. Um, okay, mongoose changed later uh, to to Comstar only, but at the time this was seen as a way of maybe slowing the clans down a bit. I'm not sure it worked actually. I don't think many people played it and it didn't really set the world on fire, but it paved the way for a number of very strong cards to, to follow in its wake. I'm curious, I know, I know with card games like this, there's a, a significant lag time between when they're designed and when they hit the market. And so I, I wonder, you know, if this is a card that's targeted towards the, um, you know, toward kind of bringing the clan speed down to make it a little bit more kind of playable against the inner sphere, you know, because it, it would, my understanding is that usually design is three or four sets ahead of publishing. And so I, I wonder if this set was already designed when cards were on the table or not, or if this was kind of the first set that was designed after the uh, the game had been published and was out there on the I'm, I'm going to speculate that it wasn't. I think I think uh, Counter Strike was on the table when they did Unlimited, and that's generally why they missed the mark. Mm. Uh, I think this, um, because remember, early in the year, the Evil Dasher deck had been banned. So they banned Effective Groundwork. Okay, that was separate, but they'd also banned Dasher D and Elite Met Warrior, and they saw speed being a serious problem. Uh, whether this was put in at the start or whether it was put in late, I, I wouldn't like to say. But I would definitely say it was put in to try and curtail some of that activity. I recognize it's not playable, uh, Mark, in, in today's standards. But at the time, uh, when I saw this card in Mercenary come out, um, I recognized that you can put more than one enhancement on a stockpile. Uh, there is no scrap uh, all other terrain cards in that region uh, on the Mercenaries edition. You can lower... Uh, the attack speed to slow um, with double uh, difficult terrain. You can you can double the difficulty of the terrain if you're willing to pay that. So um, I did I did build a deck that had two difficult. You could put two difficult terrains on your on your stockpile, and then uh, you could really have uh, a chance against the clan. Um, again, not particularly effective uh, today because uh, playing a terrain card scraps all the other terrains in that in that region. But uh, at the time you could double the enhancement. And would you do that over like a perimeter alarm, which seems like it does the same thing? Well, this can't be scrapped. I There's no way perimeter, to get rid of it. I think perimeter alarm can't be scrapped. It's one of the interesting things, if I recall. Isn't it? It's not like point defense. Can you redirect, redirect um, for perimeter alarm? I don't remember. What and then the buyout, isn't the buyout of perimeter alarm different? This is this. It uh, does cost, buyout. it does cost, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. Per, so perimeter alarm is uh, two uh, plus two a four L. So the L is perimeter. Oh. But but yeah, there's no way to get rid of it once it's once it's on there, the table. 
which seems odd, but yeah. Creative uh, terraforming is the answer to a terrain now, isn't that right, Mark? Well, it's, it's quite interesting because the, the original card was just picked as an enhancement, uh, which is why you could multi-stack them. Uh, and then it was rewritten and, and terrains replaced each other. Uh, I think, if I remember rightly, the wording on the terrain um, basically says that you can scrap all other enhancements on the site, uh, which means actually you might end up getting rid of point defense system, but I'd have to go and read it. Neither, neither tends to be played. Um, yeah, scrap all the other terrain cards in that region. Okay, so, so they've changed it. Yeah, so, yeah. Actually, yeah. Um, that, the, the creative terraforming can also get rid of uh, your point defense system. Yeah, and uh, I think Death Commando uh, can get oh, rid yeah, of it yeah. as well. Yeah, but you know, the, this, this is where it started. I, I, I think is, is, is the point here. Maybe it, it's not the great card, but actually it, it's the origins of a number of great cards. Awesome. So next up we have uh, Disguise Coordinates. So we'll read that out. Mark, you want to read that out? Uh, which version would you like? Because I've included both. Let's take um, the uh, the commander's edition because I don't have that one in front of me. Okay, uh, actually, we might we might go for both. Are they both uh, viable? Read, read Are the original. Viable or I'll, I'll, I'm going to read. I'll read the original first. Okay. Scrap disguise coordinates when it's revealed. You may activate disguise coordinates only when an opponent attacks. Until the end of turn, and that's important. You may redirect any attack to any site you control other than the stockpile. Mm. So basically, you can say what he attacks. Scrap heap, Mark, other than the scrap heap. Yes, yes. <laughs> Not stuck by, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, so you can determine where this goes. Now, if we think back to our field construction site, which is a 5-3, five, 5 armor, and you're coming across with two dashes, I might just redirect it to that and you can't kill it. I might direct it to a card and to construction that I might have six counters on or eight counters on. And uh, providing it's not a scrap when revealed, I'll just turn it over and, and lose the counters. Uh, so, so this card is actually, well, arguably abusable. Yes, it was the basis for the mechless deck. There is a deck that will play without any mechs in that basically uses this to divert mechs all over the place and then build up a huge bombing card, normally Corridor of Fire, because the counter to damage ratio is one counter to one damage. It's the only card that does that directly. All your other bombing cards are two to one. And again, that was in, in one of these uh, Mech Warrior or, or Mercenary sets. So uh, it's Mech Warrior, I'm pretty yep. sure. And, and you can see the power creep where it's going from two counters to one counter in order to improve it. Uh, and in, in the following year, the Mechless 98, uh, sorry, the World's 98, Mechless came seventh. And to my mind, if it hadn't have drawn the person it drew in the quarterfinals, it probably would have won. You can guess who the person it drew was. Peter Sundholm? Yes. <laughs> playing, his, playing his Boom Wolf, which is incredibly strong against Mechless. Wolf, Boom Wolf was one of the best things to, to counter Mechless. If he'd have pulled Terry or Yig, I, I'm pretty sure that Mechless would have beaten him um, for, for a number of reasons. We can explore the, the, the deck in, in the next uh, next review of, of Mech Warrior, maybe. Um, but at this point, this, this was the basis for that deck. Uh, and it was banned after that uh, World's 98 because they said it was not thematic to have a non-mech deck. Wait, say that again? That it was banned that you couldn't have a mechless deck? The, yeah. Yes, yes. They, they didn't did. like you playing control in Battletech. Basically, this is this is the control player's card. If, you, if you're a blue player in Magic the Gathering, you're mm -hmm. gonna play this type of a card because it's all control. When, when, when your stockpile is your life and you can redirect any attack your opponent throws at you mm -hmm. to any other card in, out there that's a legal target other than your stockpile, you're playing control. And that's that's just not the way Wizards of the Coast wanted or DCI wanted you to be playing Battletech. That's fascinating. I'll, uh, I'll definitely be asking Peter about that and this and this game as well, because uh, from what I've seen online from his magic, he's he's a blue blue control player. 
but um that being i think my point here is that if you didn't want people to play like that why put the card in the game to start with yeah it's just right. very odd we're, they, we're, well what was the rule what, what why the would rule? you reprint a banned card mark oh. mark what were they thinking they reprinted this in commander's edition Oh, is that is the card banned? Is that what? Yeah, it's yeah. banned. Oh, okay. And they and they printed it again. Yeah. The, the the problem the problem was that people were reading the area that said uh, any other site you control other than the scrap heap. So they they were they were re sending them all over the place to invalid targets and stuff because it wasn't clear. Uh, so they they rewrote it even mm -hmm. though it was banned. Yes. All right, so let's move on from that oddity. Um, hidden reserves. It's a ten. Just just so you it's know, a it's a ten. It's yeah, a ten. Yeah. It's a ten. Yes. Well, that's yeah. we made clear, right? If if uh, things get banned, it's because they were a ten. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Right. I think it's fixable. I think. What's it's... your What's your fix, Mark? Well, a lot of people say turn it into one mission, and I say, if you do that, then people aren't going to play it, and you're in exactly the same position the ability to be able to control more than multiple attacks. And if people know that you're playing that deck and it's only one mission, then they're just going to, they're going to use that to their advantage. I would say pay the three cost and for every counter above, you may redirect one mission. And that actually makes it quite interesting because you've got to guess how many missions the other guy is going to pay for, or you're going to put all your resources into it. Now, if you're putting all your resources into it, you're not building up that big corridor of fire to kill the other guy. So I, I think that would be something I would suggest that would be worth experimenting with and see how that played. Uh, the, the other reason or the other criteria for card banning is that a particular deck will win in a tournament standard environment 80% of the time. And it's close to it. Like any deck, it had its strengths and it had its weaknesses. Um, so I'm, I'm, hitting I'm Peter not... was a bad thing for it. Yeah, I, I think he, he would have won. Peter played the same deck every time. What do you mean? Peter Peter played Boom Wolf every time he oh, went okay. to Worlds. Gotcha. Now, you know, for the other... for Arata on this, you know, what do you think? Instead of going to, if for the counters over, if instead of saying to attack to any site you control, just attack to a site. So you can just say you cannot attack this particular site, or if you try, then I get to pick. I mean, that I guess, yeah. Now that I think about it, that, just means you can't attack that one site without. Well, it just means that that site happens to be an assembly with fifteen counters on it. Yeah. yeah. So. All right, so um, next one up, we got Hidden Reserves. This, uh, all right, this is another of my choices, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a staple in a free deploy mm -hmm. um, deck. Basically, it's a one plus three L card, uh, and basically says scrap when revealed and draw three cards. It's a draw engine, very, very simply. And with free deploy, you throw out your mechs, you refresh your hand, you drop out all those mechs again, you refresh your hand. This is the engine that, that allows you to draw those mechs and cards in order to keep dropping them and maintain them. Um, it's pretty cheap at one one cost for, for three cards. The only thing to be wary of is that you can actually draw yourself to death. As Gustav often says, your stockpile is your life. If you keep drawing cards, then you're sacrificing something for those cards. It seems like from my novice perspective that, you know, it'd be good to have at least kind of one of these in most decks, you know, because I'm there's definitely points where I'm getting deeper into the game where I might only have like one or two cards in my uh, hand because I've been playing missions, you know, do is that kind of a valid, a valid insight there or, or way of thinking, you know, from the kind of beginner point of view, just to kind of try to replenish that hand at some point. I, I know what you're saying. Uh, with the L buyout, four for three cards, maybe. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on, on, on your deck. I mean, if I've got two cards in my hand, but I've actually played three missions that have been very successful, mm -hmm. then I'm thinking, well, actually, I've got good value for money. Um, when would I have played them that didn't get that value for, for, for playing the card? Um, and, and yeah, okay, you can refresh your hand. I know Michael says if you start with five, you should end with five. But 
Pilot no, he said that you should start with two, right? If you, uh, no, if you were sorry, saying... sorry, five cards. Oh, okay. You start with five cards in your hand, you should end with five cards in your hand, and therefore you should have a draw engine. Yes, maybe, but if I win the game having spent four of my five cards and I win in, in five turns, mm -hmm. then I'm going to spend them. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not going to worry about replacing them because I'm I'm on right. that winning track. I'm right. I'm hitting your stop pile and I'm, I'm I guess I'm still coming from that perspective where my girlfriend and I play and our games are like 45 minutes long and so yeah <laughs> we're yeah. We're, I mean, we're not quite in that win and win in 20 minutes you know five six it, rounds you know point in our development yet. That that's the I, tournament play. This is why this is a, a an eight or a nine. I, I would I would actually rein it a nine for tournament play because mm -hmm. in in decks that are free to play and you look at a lot of the free to play units going back to that spider that we. Looked at before um, that was revised. That's a that's a logistics unit, and, and a lot of the free to play units. Hollander, I'm looking at you. Have logistics. Uh, the Yellow Jacket has logistics. Um, so you're going to have logistics in a in a free to play deck, and you're going to want to be able to refresh your hand because all those units are so cheap, but they're they're costing your hand size. Uh, in a in a big mech deck or in a uh, a boom wolf deck, this is not what you're looking at. You're looking at for damage in a quick turnaround, uh, and you're not just dumping your hand every turn. So I would I would rather have a black market connections than I would have hidden reserves because I could dump those two resources that I've picked up and get back one of those great missions uh, for for pushing for pushing the envelope or getting the overrun uh, to get a kill or get a uh, get the the game over at the last the last push. Gotcha. All right, so we rated that an eight. Possibly yeah. a nine from Gus. I'd, I'd, I'd rank it a nine. Uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing card uh, in competitive play today. Awesome. All right, next one. Love. Good stuff. This was uh, this is your pick, so why don't you... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Sandhurst Royal Military Academy. Uh, it is uh, uh, currently a nine. Uh, it's one of the top five uh, competitive deck designs uh, for Comstar only. Comstar is its own, is its own faction. That's fine. Uh, you can still use it in uh, uh, the Alliance uh, deck if you want to have access to all of the uh, Inner Sphere houses. Uh, but it is an amazing uh, card uh, that gives ongoing value at plus two attack. Uh, individual missions, uh, VTOL, uh, you're getting plus two attack every single mission on unit and it untaps over and over again. Uh, and currently you can, you can even get the bonus on a piloted unit if you're, if you're playing pilots as well. The ability to uh, keep a unit alive uh, defensively when you have initiative, you can give it a, uh, the bonus to armor. Uh, extremely versatile card. Um, logistics and politics mean that you're probably playing uh, a free deploy type style of deck um, with a bunch of those uh, low cost units uh, refilling your hand with, like we said before, that hidden reserves. Uh, at the time, uh, I'd give it a nine uh, or a 10 even, uh, and it's still a nine. Uh, it's, it's one of those uh, God cards that Wizards of the Coast printed just because it breaks the rule that most, most of these command cards that you're looking at uh, are only going to give you their bonus once per turn once per phase. This, you can have the bonus over and over and over again. You're just limited by the number of units you have, which is why, again, it synergizes with free deploy. Fantastic card. Now, uh, you know, in our previous conversation, Michael had suggested kind of eroding this or restricting it. You know, do you think that that, you know, to kind of get this, bring this kind of more so it's not as overpowered and a little bit kind of more balanced in play, you know, would you suggest doing something like that? Or how would you say uh, that? I, 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 don't, I don't think it needs an errata. I think there, there should be strong cards in the meta. This is a strong card. It's appropriately costed at four uh, plus five politics plus two logistics. So you could be paying as much as 11 for this card if you don't have the buyouts. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it only has two armor, uh, three structure. So um, it can be scrapped and hunted. It does give damage back. I like, I like the three backs. So it'll kill the couple, couple of dashers. If the dashers go after it, it'll kill at least one of them. Um, but I, I think it's I think it's appropriate to have cards like this in the game, uh, especially when it's a Comstar uh, only. So uh, right. Comstar needs boosts, sneaky boosts, sneaky overpowered ones. Very thematic. They do. They do. What do you think? What do you think, Mark? I think this is the card. If you picked one from every, oh, you pick one from the entire game that divides us. Um, I. I know it's a 10 because of the way it is. I know that you say that it breaks the mold and that's, that's fine. 
I would say that this is a contract card that breaks the mold on two counts. First, that um, there is no 0-2p buyout on it. Secondly, uh, that you have to scrap it instead of it only receiving five damage, which most contracts do. Third, it doesn't go to the other player's hand. Okay, I think when you compare it to other contracts, then the two and the three armor are, are reasonably fair. I think the three damage is, is a bit overkill. And principally, it, I, it doesn't sit well with me. It's not my type of card. It's a bit cheesy deck. Who ever heard of Serrano with, with 13 armor uh, beating on a stockpile or, or 13 attack, which is what it does. Um, I look at the card and a little while ago, I thought that actually it should have been unique because when you look at the cards, the keywords are in the wrong order. They are in the order of command, comstar, inner sphere. If you look at any unique, then the unique keyword comes before inner sphere. And I thought that there was a reasonable chance that it was originally unique and they changed it at last moment. And all they did was replace unique with comstar. I think actually it's a wider issue. And if you look at all the comstar cars, the cards in mercenaries, Anastasius Fock being one of them, I think Mindo Wartel is in there as well. They all have the comstar keyword in the wrong order. Um, so I, 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 I'm not sure what they were thinking there. It is for me power creep undeniably. And I think this card actually went too far. I think they did too much to it. Um, that's my personal opinion. I think it's a Marmite card as we would call it, say in the UK, you either love it or you loathe it. And my final thing is I live in the UK and there's only one Santos Royal Military Academy, not six of them. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Or even Comstar Unique. I mean, do you well, think it'd be fine if it was Inner Sphere Unique without the Comstar? You think, you know. Well, the, 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 the problem here is if you make it unique, then you're probably going to kill the deck archetype. Mm. Yep. Uh, and, and, and I hate to do that. Uh, I, I don't want to do that. I it's going to rely. What... It's going to rely on black market connections, right? You know, so you to get reliability if it was unique. So no, you... no. What? What? No, no. You want to have three or four of them. Them. You want you want three or four of them in the deck, um, so you can get. No, plus... I'm saying if it was unique. I'm saying in order if it was unique, then you would need to have that black market to pull it out of the deck, right? Hasty alliance to pull it out of the deck. Okay. Well, one of two options. Uh, there is a variant on on the deck that Gus has talked about. Uh, you, you run six. There is a Slowhurst variant that actually only what runs one Santos. The idea being that you fill the board with lots and lots of cheap units, twos and, and uh, lower costs, things like your Saladins, your Centurions, your Hunchbacks and stuff like that, and stifle the game area. And you either stifle the opponent with, with more and more mechs, but if you need to deliver the final blow, instead of doing Blitzkrieg, you attack one one unit at a time and when he's all tapped out or he doesn't block you use your sandhurst and give yourself plus two on everything given that good shooting is plus two on a mech is that card the equivalent of how many missions yeah right it's, it's a 10 it, it, it's, it is it, it, it's, it's an exceptionally 100 good a 10. card it's an exceptionally good card and and, and Okay, I don't like it, but I know it's a good card, and, and I have to I have to respect that. Gotcha. And we have a, a combo that you guys wanted to talk about too. So no, no, have... this 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 was um, the, the 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 list in 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 the set notes are actually uh, comparison for the keywords, the okay. placement of the Comstar keyword uh, being in most cases where the unique keyword is. Uh, again, it. it'll be in the set notes, so you can have a look Got at that it. if you want. I just pulled a few out at random. Got it. All right, so, let's, yeah, another stuff here up. coming up. Yep. yep, this is this is mine, Strip Mining Operations. It's a uh, resource. It's not uh, clan or inner sphere. You can put it in either type of deck. And this is a ramp card. Uh, when you're th thinking about ramping up to those bigger units, 
faster uh, strip mining operations allows it. Because when you think I get, uh, I'm drawing two cards and I'm making two deployments per turn, am I going to put two resources down uh, and one card under construction, try to build that up later? Uh, or can I put uh, two resources down and a unit to build. Well, strip mining allows you to do the latter. Um, it saw a great effect in that unofficial world champion, the 2001 Ghost Bear Greg and File Elemental deck. Um, it uses a free deployment mechanic. Um, and because of that, it pairs well with hidden reserves. It's got the logistics buyout. I rank it in eight. Uh, it's competitive. It still sees play. Uh, it's a fantastic card in a ramp deck. You want to be playing those big fatties? This will get it there faster. Gotcha. From my point of view, um, I, th I think this is a well-designed card. When you look at it, it's 1-2-L. It works with free deploy. Great. But it's also paying a penalty for that. It's a 2-5, which means it's more susceptible to damage. It's got no attack. Uh, you can tap it for a resource, and it's a free deploy. It, it, it is ramp deck material. It's a good card. It's well-designed. It's an 8 for me. Awesome. Next one up, we have a unique, uh, one of the unique personas. Uh, this uh, particular individual, Sun Tzu Lao, uh, he's, man, he's got, he's got some messed up uh, siblings and his dad's messed up too, but man, they work well together. Uh, he is part of the card advantage uh, lock engine that's out there with regard to subterfuge. Um, he was reprinted in Commander's Edition uh, so that he has more versatility. The mercenary vision says take a subterfuge card from the top of your scrap heap and put it in your hand so you're looking at timing back when mercenaries first came out because if there was anything but a subterfuge card on the top of your scrap heap he really did nothing for you when you're looking at commander's edition you can pay, take any subterfuge card from your scrap heap so you're playing a subterfuge heavy deck you've got sun Tzu out you've got max's legacy out you're recycling those uh, subterfuge cards every single turn. Um, and uh, whether that's a misride of commands, uh, whether that's manipulation of Romano, whatever you need to do, uh, he can do it for you and he can do it better than anybody else, uh, better than black market connections uh, because it costs nothing better than Melissa. If subterfuge is your game, uh, Sun Tzu is your guy to play it with. He is, however, susceptible to the arrow four. He's the one of the standard ones we're looking at where the, uh, uh, the structure on these command cards is one. Uh, I rank him a seven uh, in, uh, in the uh, niche uh, Leo Dirty Tricks deck. I, I, th I think if you if you go with the Commander's Edition version, then he, he's a little higher than that for me, probably an eight. Uh, the the update in CE definitely made him much more playable. Compare him to Melissa, you know, tap, uh, scrap a card, return one from your yeah, scrap heap. She's a two, two P. He's a little more expensive than that, arguably. But if you go in sub to huge deck, then this, this guy that, does not look very happy at all is is something that you need to consider and that pairing with the legacy which basically means you can play pay that card for free is is very powerful it's just hard to pull great card Every, Eight. yeah everybody loves bribe pilots everybody loves free bribe pilots even more cost you less it cost you less I like for personalities, the, the, the art on this looks good. A lot of the personalities are kind of questionable, but I think this one is a solid little portrait there. Um, and this kind of makes me think about back to Oda, you know, with the 5-1. I, I just, I'm, I'm starting to become more convinced that they just accidentally flipped those numbers on that, on that card as a misprint. All right, next, Mark, you're up targeting Ace. I have to say again, I let Gus choose first. And, and to be honest, I'm quite happy to do that. Uh, I, I went for this as, as one for you, for you missile fans uh, and, and, try and try and accommodate all tastes. Uh, it's a pilot that allows you to re, uh, not re-roll, but modify your missile die rolls. And in that respect, he's a pilot. You may add or subtract one from the die roll for each missile fired from a mech piloted by targeting ace okay use this ability immediately after rolling the dice well if you think about narc which is just you can subtract one he's a narc on steroids mm -hmm. and all of a sudden if you've got a mech with narc thinking about ryokan d with this guy on it then every missile that's between uh five and one oh, sorry five and two is definitely going to score a three and your ones are going to score a two 
So he's definitely a way to up the damage value of anybody playing with missiles, if you like that kind of thing. Personally, I'm not the greatest fan of missiles. They're notoriously under, unreliable. This is a way of giving yourself a bit more reliability at the expense of paying for it. Um, I think the only thing I'd say is as a pilot, he doesn't give you any initiative. But then the die roll uh, ability is quite powerful. Um, great card, just not for a great deck. Five. Yeah, he's a he's a three in my book, but he does pair well with Ryokin D and a retrofitted missile rack. So, I mean, in the right deck, uh, you can make a missile boat and you can make it do a whole lot of damage to a stockpile. The problem is those Ryokin Ds are subject to hunt down. They're only medium speed and uh, it's a whole lot of investment, three cards uh, to make a missile boat. I, I, I rank the entire missile deck concept is subpar. It's a uh, tier three at best. And uh this guy makes it a little bit more viable. So if that's if that's your game, go for it. If not, uh, I can see why you want to be competitive. You're not playing missiles. Yeah. So coming up, Gustav, you have another card, Underworld Connections. Yeah, Underworld Connections is a really uh, interesting card design in that it's a command inner sphere only. Uh, they don't use the Yakuza uh, out there in, uh, in clan world. It's a zero cost non-resource command card, but it operates as a resource. Um, you can place any counter on a card with uh, two counters of the same type. So you have at least one counter on a card under construction. You can basically use it as a resource and put two counters, uh, remove that one and put two down. Now, when you're thinking about a sneaky Leo subterfuge deck and you're looking at misrouted commands, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, it was a ratted in Counter Strike, and now it's uh, choose any card in play. Commander's edition. Or Commander's edition. Mm -hmm. Choose any card in play or under construction. Replace one counter on that card with two counters of the same type. Use this ability only during your deploy phase. So you used to be able to put this, uh, uh, you can put one counter on top of their stockpile, because that's a card, uh, and uh, you could double up with suicide troops. Uh, they ratted this in... Uh, the commander's edition and so it's a it doesn't work quite as well but it's still a sneaky card uh, it's arrow four bait uh, but it can kill a dasher if, if, if the dasher runs at it so i rank it a five i think it's zero one it's an anything bait anything bait that's true unless you're running a dart <laughs> or isn't there a a, a koshi out there that's an oh wait it's got ap it's right? got AP, yeah yeah even, even the koshi can kill it <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, in, interesting card, um, interesting design. You need a deck that uses some sort of counter. We talked about hip shattered in the previous one. That that could make that. But if you think about Trip, trapped, 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 yeah, trapped is the one that arguably you you could turn into uh, something quite quite uh, nasty in that respect. Um, one of those cards that you keep in the back of your mind and think mm, might just help. Yeah. Let's let's talk about uh, Vandervon. You know, coming up next, Vandervon Chistu. Do you get where? Where's he in the lore? I'm not familiar. I haven't read far enough to. He's the Sakon of uh, Clan Jade Falcon. Um, he's uh, he's arrow four bait at a three one one. Uh, but just when you're looking at the uh, source material to game realization, they hit the money on the head with Aletha, and uh, he is really not quality at all at four cost with 5p buyout you're paying nine for the ability to restock the top card of your scrap heap and put it back underneath your deck so he is giving you one life per turn for four cost uh, there's no time in the game that i am going to not want a unit uh, to block and save my scrap heap a lot more damage than one per turn. Yeah. Uh, he's just really 100% uh, a, uh, a, a cat uh, fodder. I will feed this card to my cat. He's a terrible rare to pull. I rank him a two. I, I'm, I'm surprised you rank him a two. I'd have thought you'd have gone for a one. Personally, I would agree with the two because I think he takes his beard styling trips from, uh, tips from Travis. <laughs> yeah, that's the only reason he's a two. Yeah, uh -huh. he does have a nice beard. There you go. He's he's a, he's a terrible card. Yeah. Okay. What were they thinking? All right, you guys want to soldier on? We want to get through missions, or we want to uh, what's that? All right, yeah, go for it. All right, so let's uh, dive into missions.